Hi, everyone. It's Iman Ubusi of Sway Media, and you're listening to Life After the Crown by Tim Tialdo. Hey, everybody. My name is Tim Tialdo, and welcome to Season 2 of the Life After the Crown podcast. It's hard to believe we already have a year of episodes under our belt. And if you haven't had a chance to hear any of those, I do encourage you to go back and listen to them. There are many valuable interviews that you will definitely gain some wisdom from. Now, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, each episode of Life After the Crown, I interview former pageant contestants and title holders and women of influence who share advice and stories on how to help you succeed in the world of pageants, but more importantly, how you can flourish in the professional world once your pageant journey comes to an end. As always, I appreciate you taking the time to download this podcast. I do value your time, and I'm glad you're here listening. So let's get started. My guest today was Miss New York United States 2015 and second runner-up that year at the Miss United States pageant. She is a Moroccan-American self-made entrepreneur, the founder and CEO of Sway Media, and was also a member of the first-ever all-female selection committee for Miss Universe 2018. She is on a mission to change the women's media landscape. Through her experience with business, pageantry, and STEM, she noticed a biased media representation of women which inspired her to launch Sway, which is a digital platform highlighting stories of female leaders challenging the status quo and championing the voices of female changemakers through substantive and inspiring content. Her podcast, Women Who Sway, was number two on iTunes in 2015 and was ranked in the top five best podcasts for women entrepreneurs by Inc. Magazine. She was named by CIO Magazine the number one female entrepreneur to watch in 2018. She has also had the honor to be one of 2018's keynote speakers at Harvard's Women in Business. Iman Ubu, you are certainly a game changer. Very honored to have you on the podcast. Welcome to Life After the Crown. Thank you so much. Wow. I appreciate so, it. Yeah, you get to judge Miss U Universe uh, in 2018. Talk about that experience coming from the United States system and then stepping onto the big stage there in Thailand. Yeah, honestly, it was definitely an incredible experience. I didn't really think I would ever have the chance to experience. I've always been obviously a very big fan of the Miss Universe, Miss USA organization. I've competed in Colorado in the system, Miss Colorado USA, although I came very, very close. I was the first runner up to Miss Colorado USA in 2014, I believe. And because I didn't get it, actually, I ended up moving to New York and trying out for another system. So oh, okay. being able to finally be on the other side, and that was my first time, I think, really judging a pageant, and it had to be Miss Universe. So to be honest, I was so nervous. I <laughs> never even thought I would be nervous, even sitting on the other side. Like I wasn't even competing or anything, so I can only imagine, and I've been in those shoes before, but even on the Miss Universe stage, I can only imagine how nervous uh, these women are but they've all been so amazing to interview and I really I think I fell in love again with with pageantry Um, and I remember posting a really great post on Instagram about how all the pageant critics should definitely get to experience um, a seat at the judge table one day because it will completely shift their perspective about why pageantry is so important. And I got to finally, even though I believed it and I, I competed before, being on the judge table really reminded me why pageantry exists and why it's become more of an empowering organization and platform than your you know, typical beauty standards type of competition. Well, walking on stage uh, in the Colorado pageants and then the New York pageant, talk about what it was like to sit on the other side of that chair and have to basically, you know, figure out who's going to be the winner here. Yeah. I mean, we had also to, we picked between what, 94 girls. So it's not like a a state level where it was basically 50 ish. Um, I think Colorado was and same with New York, um, the United States here. But this was women all over the country. Uh, I got to, it's almost like I traveled the world while I was in Thailand with all these women. They all got to to talk to us about their cultures. And it was really interesting, um, the focus that year or this past year on women empowerment in each of these countries and how um, far or behind they are compared to the U.S. Because, you know, most people that were on the judge table were living in the U.S. So, it was almost like a, and it matters to me because that's my industry right now of, of all that I do. I basically sit 
and try to find the best female stories to tell. And being on that chair really uh, reminded me why I do what I do today and how aligned it is with my pageant journey and, and the importance of like storytelling when it comes to women's issues, women's experiences and different things. So it definitely, there were a lot of hard questions that we've asked and the, the girls did really well to navigate around that and they were very well informed. But I mean, I think it was an incredible experience from a storytelling perspective, which I can't emphasize enough because it's sad that most people that watch pageantry can't see that aspect of it. I think it's one of the most important, the interview portion is one of the most important to me and it's always been. Um, and it's, I, I hope that one day people can understand that, that side of pageantry. Well, let me ask you a quick question since you were on that panel and you, you said there were some tough questions that were asked. Um, as people listen to this podcast all the time, they you know want to know about the behind the scenes and, and everything that goes on. And some of them, they're wondering, you know, what is it like at that elite level? So if you go to Miss Universe, 94 countries, mm-hmm. um, you ask the tough questions. Can you give me – and just, just one example. You don't have to – expand on that but just one example of what you think a tough question was i mean i think for for example for when we when we talked to the delegate from russia there were a lot of questions about the russian and american you know foreign relations you know i never ever thought that that would it wasn't something i asked or thought i would ask i mean she's also only 18 years old uh, (laughs) or maybe 19 but, you know, the judges weren't afraid to go there because I think in this day and age now, you need to be informed, especially about your country and how it, you know, how it stands in, in foreign policy and all that, as, as well as questions around women's issues. For example, a lot, a lot of the questions were focused on what if you were to win the title, what would be you know, the first women's issue you would, you would use your platform to tackle and why is that important to you? Um, so, or like how, what do you think about the USA? Obviously, what do you think about today? Was the makeup of women in legislation and, and Congress and all that stuff. So that's also important to be, uh, informed about, but the judges were not afraid to, there was a, no limit, which I think back when I was competing, I think politics were a little bit off limits. Um, and it was communicated to prior to the to the competition, but now it seems like even on the Miss USA stage, judges are going there. It's been a big focus now. Do you like that trend? Because as you mentioned, it, it didn't always seem to be that way. And, and certainly in the last probably, I would say, three to four years, it has been very much at the forefront. The political conversation has been taken to the pageant stage. Um, do you see that as a trend that's going to fade or something that's here to stay? I think it's here to stay for at least the next 10 years because it is a big, that's where the, the national dialogue or international dialogue focus is. And if someone is going to represent the universe or the country or even a state, they need to have a, at least a, a minimum understanding of what's going on in the politics side. I do, however, have to say that some of the questions um, asked to pageant uh, contestants are probably harder than what we've even seen on the debate in the pre- presidential debate in 2016. <laughs> That's true. Uh, you know? So if anything, I am for this trend because in a way you're preparing these awesome women, incredible women to one day run for office and they can do it. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background if we could. Now, you were born and raised in Morocco until you were, I guess, 15 mm-hmm. years old. And then your parents decide yeah. to pick up everything and move to Colorado here in the USA. Now, at 15, Mm -hmm. moving from Morocco, I can't imagine that that was easy for you. Can you talk about what that was like and how you handled the transition? Yeah, it it was absolutely harder than I had anticipated. I think, as you know, obviously, when you're 15, you're still going through puberty. You're like this wild teenager. And all of a sudden, your parents decide to just pick you up and then take you to a whole new world that you've never even seen before, not even on vacation. We've never spoken the language. You don't know the cultural barriers that you might face. All that stuff, having to go through it my first year was really difficult for me. And and at the time, maybe I didn't realize it. But also now looking back, I definitely went through a mild depression phase. Um, A lot of the, I think, experiences have still kind of affected me, um, you know, deep down. It wasn't anything traumatic, but I think because I never really made peace with that and made peace with the anger and frustration I had towards my parents for even making that decision for us, especially when 
you you as a, a young girl you know that you didn't really need to move abroad at the time for me when i heard about people moving away from their countries it's because they were looking for a better lifestyle for more money um because they were struggling where they were so we were the complete opposite my parents had really really good jobs really great careers uh we went to great schools we had a great life so my question at the time and something that i couldn't wrap my head around was why why do you why do you want to move to the US leave everything behind family everything you've worked for to start over literally over like my parents had to be cashiers at like a pink super or working at like Caesar's pizza that's literally how low they had to start over but now i get it it was all because they wanted better opportunities for their children and they were willing to sacrifice everything they had for it so you know i as as a 15 year old i did not understand that and i didn't want to understand it i was just wanted to be angry towards them towards the world and hate my life because that's what a teenager does but you know i think over time i started integrating better and adapting to the lifestyle i learned english pretty quickly i think i had a pretty good experience in high school compared to what i anticipated so things started to finally come into place and i i was like okay maybe this is too bad after all uh but you know that first year was really tough for me did you live here in denver i did yeah we lived we moved to aurora uh because my mom's uh sister grew up basically in denver she went to school there and got married there and so she, it was the only family we had in the us so we basically went from morocco to random colorado i've never even <laughs> heard of it before <laughs> I've never seen the snow before and at the first time, you know, we we oh, moved down here in the summer. Yeah, and so obviously I fell in love with it and Colorado became home. What a small world I live in Aurora, so that's crazy. Oh, amazing. So, tell me what reason you decided to start competing in pageants then when you got here to Colorado? So, I've gotten so when I was in college at CSU, I've gotten a lot of invites from Miss America system to compete at Miss Colorado, but I didn't really think of myself as having one of one I, a talent. I didn't really I couldn't come up with what I'm going to perform and what I'm going to do. Uh obviously I thought about belly dancing cuz I'm Moroccan, but <laughs> that just didn't seem like me. And um too, also in college I never really thought of myself as someone who would even understand pageantry or I I basically just ignored those invites as much as I could because I was afraid to come into terms with oh I have to, I have to actually go shopping for a gown and learn how to walk in heels no way so when I moved out obviously to college and then moved back with my parents um I moved to Germany actually after college to uh pursue an internship there and when I came back because my address now was my parents house my mom kept getting those invites to Miss Colorado what not and then I started getting Miss Colorado USA invites so while I was in Germany um my mom signed me up basically for the first ever Miss Colorado USA that I participated in was like in 2013 ish and then I went for it so she her kind of argument was you know i i grew up playing tennis and then i got injured um so i kind of lost that hobby hobby so she's like you need something that you know makes you feel more competitive again something you fall in love again a hobby outside of school and just work you need to just refine yourself if you will and this is a good way for you to push yourself out of your comfort zone because you never really were like the girly girl type of woman um so she's like just try it and we'll see how it goes so basically it was all my mom you know nudging and so when i did that first pageant i placed in top 15 and i really fell in love with the process it wasn't so much the competition itself obviously i'm competitive and i was always trying to win but i think when i decided i was going to compete between that moment to the actual competition i was a completely different person i just changed it's almost like it pushed me to really really discover who I was um and that preparation process is what kept me wanting to keep going because I felt like I had something to work towards I had a goal I went back to the gym I I healthier I practiced with a pageant coach um I basically worked on myself for the first time ever and that was a whole different universe to me. Well that's really cool that it kind of kind of brought you out of your shell, shell so to speak from you know making the transition over here to the United States and then just kind of mm-hmm. I guess finding yourself again it sounds like. Yeah, no absolutely and I think I've never really 
taken or even I was never taught to take time to work on myself for as long as I remember. I think prior to pageantry, it was always like work on school, work on after school activities, work on sports, practice that. But there was never like, okay, now you need to work on yourself. That includes physically, mentally, psychologically, professionally, everything. And I had never really understood that, you know, I didn't really ever go through a process of self-awareness and building that. And, and I saw the transformation and that's really what I've been looking for every time I competed. Yes, winning is important to me, but I think the more I competed, the more I prepared, the better I got in life. So all the stuff I was preparing for pageantry, whether it's like working with a pageant coach on interview skills, uh, thinking quick on my feet, walking, uh, posing in a powerful pose that makes me feel confident, that ultimately ended up helping me so much in getting every single job I have ever interviewed for. And that was to me, that was like my training um, on the side, like my boot camp for myself. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it was. <laughs> now, I was reading a little bit about your pageant journey, and I actually watched an interview with you. Uh, you were asked by a male judge whether you would like to be beautiful or smart. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk about your response and I, I guess what ignited in you because of it? I, I don't remember what was my response. I just know that I, I, I did make a point to say that I don't think as women we have to be asked that question because we don't have to choose and that I've always been hard on myself because I wanted to be both. Like in school, I've always wanted to be the smart one, but I also didn't want to be like, you know, not attractive or whatever. You, no one ever wishes for that. So I've always strived to be the best I could in both, like whether that's physically, professionally, intellectually, all that stuff. So for that question to be asked, it just made me like I had to choose and I, that I was not as a human being, as a woman capable of achieving both. So that ignited something that at the time I didn't really feel because obviously you're in pageants and you're like trying to impress the judges and trying to say the right thing. But I think as after the pageant and as I started like going through life and, and, and the real world and in career, it started replaying in my mind because I started getting kind of the same vibe, the same feeling, the same kind of questions or even stereotypes while I was going through my own career. So that's when I, re I remembered, holy crap, sorry, I don't know if I can say that, but no, of course you, uh, can. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it, these, these narratives are instilled in us pretty early and then also society reinforces with questions like this or acting a, a certain way towards you know someone like even when i went to raise money as a female founder uh, a lot of the the kind of first impressions that were communicated to me later on like oh hey i thought you were only this beauty queen with a, a powerpoint and a dream i didn't think you were actually serious about this so in a way something like a miss new york u.s title that i was so proud of became a hindrance for me as I went out to be taken seriously and raise money for a business that actually has an impact on women and is actually trying to challenge the same narrative and the same stereotypes that I was going through while doing while well, while raising money. Um, so I guess going back to that question that the male judge, it all starts there. We're, we've never really asked men that you want to be physically strong or smart. <laughs> or do you want to have abs or a brain? You know what I mean? Like, we, we never say that. I've, I grew up with a brother and I don't ever think that he's, that's something he's ever gone through. And he was raising money too, the same time I was going through. And so we were comparing notes. And it's just like, as much as people don't want to admit it, these biases exist. And I think that's ultimately why, um, you know, like Miss Universe organization made that decision that I think it's also best to have an all-female panel because no one understands us like us and sometimes and i'm not saying all men sometimes men unconsciously are biased or kind of approach these questions in a way that feels more discouraging or disempowering than actually empowering uh, I, I totally understand that and exactly where you're coming from I've, I've been a part of that world for a while and, and i get it you know as a man in that world um, it, it is a very fine line that you have to walk all the time and so i i, I totally understand what you're saying um, you were mentioning mm -hmm. um, when you were trying to get into business, you were trying to raise money. And I read these stories about um, a certain investor or investors that had some uh, some interesting things to say to you. One said, uh, you're too pretty to be a CEO. Do you know that building a business is hard, right? And then uh, I, I don't know if it was the same guy, but another one said, oh, you wore a pencil skirt for me. 
Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) going into those, yeah. (laughs) So you go into those situations, you're trying to raise a quarter million bucks to start sway. Um, what what do you say to those guys who, you know, obviously you're in there thinking I got to act a certain way because I want their money, but at the same time, I'm not going to take this crap. No, I mean, at first I was, you know, I would just laugh it off and be like, (laughs) because I was so awkward about it. And I literally didn't think that this was a prevalent issue. And I, I'm like, maybe it's my fault. I would always kind of blame it on me. I'm like, maybe I shouldn't wear like a pencil skirt. You know, maybe I should actually now it's funny. It's subconsciously that really affected me a lot because I don't, I haven't bought any pencil skirts ever since I started sweat. Can you imagine that? And I'm, <laughs> I'm going through a, a pants phase and I was talking to someone about this recently and I'm like, yeah, I've been going through a pants phase since like 2016 or 2017. And she goes, Oh really? Do you think that the pencil skirt like event has like issue has actually affected you and I never put two and two together so just a quick anecdote but um going back to what to say to these men I I think now I see it as more of an opportunity to educate and inform and just really point out the bias and the stereotype because sometimes again I don't think it necessarily comes from a bad place or malintentions I think they just don't know any better So I see it as more instead of being aggressive or angry or mad about it, take this as an opportunity to slowly change the narrative, even if it's like one by one man, you know, but it is, I would have to say it is very discouraging. And I know when I first, now I'm kind of used to it, sadly, (laughs) you know, it's not something you want to say, but when I first started, I would have times where I would just want to cry in the shower after these meetings, because like I said, I wasn't even able to openly talk about this with my brother or my dad or even my boyfriend because I would automatically assume that whoever I tell this to would blame me for that kind of behavior. Like I I could already see my dad say, but why did you wear a pencil skirt then? Or why did you wear makeup or things like that, you know, because they were societally speaking like we are used to putting the blame in the victim and the same with rapes and with sexual harassment. But I think now that women are starting to finally talk about it, and again, this goes back to the power of storytelling, now we're starting to reevaluate how we approach these stories. And when someone comes forward, we have to approach it differently than how we used to. Um, so I still have, a, I don't, I can't consider myself an expert in what to say in these situations, because I'm sure if I'm again in one of these situations, I'm probably going to freeze and try to find a way to really do this the right way. It's definitely a learning experience, but I'm really hoping that that's something we don't talk about again, um, 10 years from now, if I were to raise a bigger rate, a bigger fund, a bigger round or whatnot, because I think that's really what is hurting a lot of women to scale and grow businesses that are impactful is because you go through these situations and then you, you're immediately discouraged and doubted. And that affects your self-confidence, that affects your performance, that affects your leadership and, and the belief that you can even do it. So you end up just dropping it or still running the business in a way that you're not too sure about because someone criticized you or someone uh, thought that you were too pretty to be see, or that instead you should be endorsing beauty products because you'd make more money doing that than actually running a business because you're not capable of doing that. God forbid. <laughs> so, so, um, it, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. I can talk about this all day and I could write a book about this, but well, you know, it sounds like you're it. definitely passionate about it and rightfully so, you know, considering, you know, uh, those types of situations that you and many others have been through. Now you want to shift the conversation from, what we're talking about here, what women look like to what their Mm -hmm. capabilities are. Uh, So as somebody who has competed in the pageant world where, you know, looks do matter in some ways, um, what is your plan or vision with Sway to accomplish that? Well, so I think for us, it's always been substance and style, substance and style. So like even with pageantry, with, with, yes, we're shifting the conversation to talk about women's capabilities, but that does not mean that we don't want women to look their best uh, or that we, you know, undermine people's look but we're just saying that we're not going to be leading a woman's value with looks because that's how media has always done it you know every article every cover every um every magazine is about the women in it what they're wearing the makeup they're wearing um how thin they look how fit they look and then basically making women wanting to be them and then selling them products diet you know tips whatever it is 
just so that women can get over those insecurities. We're, we're coming in and saying, no, let's highlight women from a perspective that shows what women are capable of, whether that's leading political movements, cultural movements, leading companies, starting companies, disrupting industries, that those are the conversations we want to highlight and we want to put the spotlight on. Um, and also not only that, but we want to invite women to be part of these conversations and part of the, the storytelling. We want women to, to use their own voices to elevate their own missions, struggles, successes, tips, advice, et cetera. That's why we launched Way 2.0 recently is because yes, we're, we have an editorial team that focuses on finding stories and telling them, but then we also want to encourage more women to come out of their shell and really start conversations uh, about what they're passionate about and, and follow other women who are advocating for things that they're interested in as well. So it's almost really creating this community-driven media platform rather than having editors constantly tell women what to do and how to think and what's what. So that's kind of the idea behind Sway. It's not like we don't want to talk about looks or anything. It's, it's, it's just embracing the idea that women are multidimensional. And yes, maybe we'll talk about what Serena Williams wore to her tennis match, but we, don't, we also talk about how Serena Williams is investing in companies, why she's doing it, everything she's done to advocate for women, things like that, that also matter and I think matter more to, to this new generation nowadays. Well, you mentioned, you know, kind of the old perspective that editors had cast in magazines for women. You know, it's all about the looks and losing weight and mm -hmm. you know, right bikini line and all that. I guess, are you kind of the antithesis of a you know, Cosmo or a Vogue? Is that kind of where you would position yeah, yourself, so I, to speak? Yes, I would say, you know, we have nothing against Cosmo or Vogue, and I think they have established their uh, editorial proposition. I think I don't see Vogue or Cosmo completely, you know, go out of style. I think there are some people that still want to read that, but I, I do think that we need a brand like Sway to also coexist with these magazines so that we have a balance. So if I were to maybe want to uh, read about sex tips or whatever, because that's how I'm feeling right now, then I'll go to Cosmo. That's really the place to go for that. But then if I want to read about how to run my business and maybe what other women are advising in terms of fundraising or hearing other women's stories who are going through similar struggles than me and what they've done about it, then I will go to Sway. So it's like it's it's about creating that balance where yes, women we can still have fashion magazines because they're very inspirational, visual, um, and gorgeous to look at. But then we should also have uh, media brands that focus on the other ninety percent stuff that women care about, which is career, culture, health, um, and really women's issues and how that affects them every day. So your brand is focused on um, basically empowering and uplifting women um, who aren't afraid to challenge, you know, what we'll call the status mm -hmm. quo. Now, everybody defines the status quo differently. In your opinion, what is the quote unquote status quo? Well, it's basically the, the traditional outdated narrative that, that we grew up with as women. Um, obviously, the first one, for example, is that beauty and brains are mutually exclusive. Uh, that's a, that's not something that we, that's definitely something that we want to challenge. Also the many like pseudoscience um, that, you know, some magazines and content providers use to sell women products, uh, unnecessary products. For example, you know, we can go into the health section and, and see how uh, we've been told as women that we have to have periods every month because X, Y, Z, that's not the case. Now, now, more women gynecologists are coming uh, and talking about uh, that you can actually and you should probably think about turning off your period because it increases your chances of having ovarian cancer and cervical cancer, which none of the other, you know, most health uh, con content haven't really focused on things like this. So really bold topics, um, you know, women coming out and talking about the sexism when, um they go out and raise money. Uh, so we just published an article that had five women that responded to that kind of sexism and what they had to say about it. Uh, so, so things, you know, that are, aren't really the focus of most female media companies. You won't really see things like this in Cosmo or Vogue or Marie Claire. Maybe you might once a month here and there, but it's not their focus. So we kind of are taking that niche 
and go in all in on it. It's like anyone that has a different perspective that challenges what a quote unquote status quo is, let's talk about it. Let's put it out there. Well, I love that you're doing it. And I've had a lot of women on here who, you know, it's women's empowerment is huge right now. I mean, it's, it's the cultural standard at this point. Um, and mm-hmm. it's obviously one of the reasons that you've created your business. Uh, I, I, I have to ask this just because I am a man and, you know, I, I talk to a lot of the women who come on here about it is how do you handle the topic of men? Because I actually saw some national title holders post about this the other day in which um, they were talking about women's empowerment and feminism in one light, but not man hating in another light. And how do you handle mm. kind of that balance of, you know, how the women's empowerment movement handles the topic of men if it comes up? in your, in your articles or or whatever. So kind of walking that fine line between, um, being pro woman and not anti-men. Is that what you mean? Basically. Yes. Right. Okay. So yeah, I know because you're, a lot of people want to label us as a feminist brand, which is not, I mean, I don't mind it, but it's not something that we, um, are vocally about, we're not saying we're a feminist brand, we're just saying that we're a media company that is taking a different angle to women's stories because, We are not against men contributing content. So that's one. We have a lot of contributors that happen to be men, and I'm always looking for men to weigh in on this. And if anything, I also created, when we first launched Sway, 70% of our audience was men, uh, which is interesting. And then it went to 50, and now it's like 30% men. Because I also see Sway as a platform that men can go to to educate themselves and be informed as to what some experiences are when it comes to navigating this world as a woman. You know, it could be everything from a woman's perspective on on being a survivor of sexual harassment and what she would tell to her, you know, harasser, all the way to, you know, women going through sexism while fundraising that most guys didn't even know about. When I published that Harper's Bazaar piece, I've gotten a lot of men reach out to me about that and saying, wow, thank you for sharing that because we had no idea that this is actually like real life. You know, we hear about it every now and then, but we don't always realize that someone close to us, whether it's a sister, a daughter, might be going through that experience. So I, I see Sway as not in time, and if anything, it would be smart for a man to immerse himself in some of the content that we have because it offers him a different perspective of living the world almost through a female lens. And sometimes you're just not aware of these experiences. So it it won't hurt you to understand where these women are coming from, especially, you know, you have, you probably have a mother, a sister, a daughter, or just a a best friend who's female. So it's always good to really know our perspective and be able to put yourself in our shoes, um, especially when it comes to the hard hitting type of content like abortion or sexual harassment. I know it's not always easy for a man to want to dive into that kind of stuff, but I think it could be more informative and it could actually advance the conversation to, between the genders. Well, I, lo- I love that's the I love that that's the angle you take because I can relate to that in some way because I am a male in a very female dominated industry. Obviously, I mean there aren't many men in pageants doing too much, and obviously I get to deal with um, doing these podcast interviews all the way to you know introducing these girls on stage and getting to know them off the stage, and I, I can tell you I deal with the sexism from even just talking to guys, because of course they approach me and they're like, oh, that's a tough job, isn't it? If you Mm -hmm. look at it that way. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I I tend to always try to look at all the girls as as like a daughter. Um, And so, yeah, it is. It's kind of a cultural norm and I get it. I totally get it. I just, I'm glad to know that it's that balance that you're, you're, you're treading that line of just trying to figure out how to help men understand what you guys are going through so we can help make the situation better. So, uh, so to speak. Absolutely. I also think that it it shouldn't take a man to have like some, some guys say, I never really understood this before until I got, until I recently had a daughter, but it also, it's important to, to, to make sure that we're not saying, oh, unless you have a daughter, you won't get it, you know, because you should get it whether or not you have a daughter and you should care about it, not just get it, but you should care about these issues whether or not you have a daughter because that's, I don't think that's like an excuse. Well, no, not at all. I mean, I have a one-year-old daughter, so obviously I don't know, you know, at the teenage or, you know, even early 20s level what Mm -hmm. it's like to have a daughter in that regard. But yeah, I can assure you as a father to a little girl, um, I get it. You know, I, I, she's I the world it. to me. And, you know, as she grows up, I'm thinking, gosh, if she gets treated like I saw many treated, 
Mm-hmm. I'm going to be I'm going to be a rough father. I can tell it's going to be yeah. it's going to be interesting. But um, I, I wanted to to ask you. I, I saw a post the other day on Instagram. One of the girls had posted a sign that said, "Girls just want to be CEO." You are a CEO of your own business. Tell me what that feels like to be able to say that. Yeah, I I don't really, you know, that's interesting. I've never had that question before. And I don't think I've ever stopped and, and thought about how good it feels or how exciting it is because that, being a CEO is not a glamorous title or a, a glamorous position, to be honest, especially when it's a startup. Because what it really means, and I'm going to be honest with, with you about this because not a lot of p- people talk about it, is that you have to wear 60 hats throughout the day, switch gears, and literally run around trying to figure the next steps, uh, whether it's what's tomorrow, what's next month for the business. So if anything, it, it's a lot more work than it's not a, a, a status. If, if anything, to me now, when I, when I hear CEO, I cringe because I know how, how hard <laughs> and how much sacrifices you have to give. You know, it's not like... When I see it, you know, when I see my name and then next to it, founder and CEO, I used to dream of that. And I'm so grateful that I'm able to do what I love doing and, and be kind of the visionary behind what I'm doing. But I have to tell you, it's it's a lot more work and, and it's not a glamorous title to have uh, unless you have all the resources in the world and have raised a lot of money to get things where you need them to be. But especially the first five years of a startup, CEO are not exciting. So, but I will definitely let you know how it really feels when Sway <laughs> becomes, you know, multi-million dollar, hundred million dollar a year. Because now that's going to be glamorous, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the beginning. So, I guess knowing what you've gone through already in these first five years, would you do it again mm-hmm. if you had the opportunity? Of course, a hundred percent. And that's and that's something I I want to emphasize is that. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's a lot of sacrifices and a lot of sleepless nights and doubtful moments and crying. But if you do it for the right reasons, if you are truly out there on a mission, not just to make money or have cool titles like CEO or just be out there um, doing your thing in the, in the spotlight, but if you're truly on a mission to change something and you have a vision to do that, whether it takes five years, 10 years, or 60 years, I think you will have all the fun with it and it will be all worth it because I cannot imagine myself right now being in a, a, an office setting, working for a company that, you know, I, I haven't started. I feel like I can, by this time, at this stage right now, I'm unemployable. So there is no going back for me. So I really have to. <laughs> I'm right to, there with you. I totally to, to get make it. this work. <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, and tell everybody, you know, you talked about the 60 hats that you wear. Let's let's just talk about a day in the life of Iman Ubu. Um, I read that you have about 250 contributors writing content for you three times a day. That's an incredible volume of content. Um, can you talk about when you wake up and you go to work, give me the nine to five or probably more like nine to 12 uh, at, yeah, at midnight it's yeah, like to talk about that three, day? Sometimes it's 3 a.m. to, you know, 12 p.m. Sometimes it's like 8 a.m. all the way to 8 p.m. So it depends. But it, it so it's different every day. But I try to now stick to at least a morning routine that I feel like works for me. And this is going back to what pageantry taught me is that no matter what in life, you should always be working on yourself. So my mornings now are dedicated to, you know, meditation, yoga or, or boxing, just getting my body moving um, and getting ready for the day with, with already positivity under my belt. Because I think I used to just get up and go straight to my email and straight to, you know, office and look at Instagram and social media. And I think that what, what, did, what that did to me is uh, almost starting my day in a negative frequency, negative way, which ultimately altered my entire day and made it horrible. So I think it's important for a lot of founders um, and people who are on the go to take the morning to themselves. And so that's what I do. Then I tackle um, the to-do list that I give myself the day before, because if I let emails just dictate what I have to do during the day, then I'm never going to get to my actual to-do list. So that includes obviously um, running the editorial team and figuring out the content of the day, the promotion of all of that, Um, Any interviews being set up for our editorial calendar, I just check on those with our editorial team and then um, go through any like issues with the team that needs, you know, anything that like is priority 
from a product development to editorial to social media to basically everything. And and so after that, I'm I'm either in meetings, um, obviously stick for meetings just twice a week. Otherwise, you're wasting a lot of your time doing meetings that sometimes don't bring any value. So I learned that the hard way. Cause the first year of Sway, I was in meetings almost 24-7. And then I would have to take the night to actually get to my to-do list. So you learn. But like I said, so it goes between editorial to product development to strategy on marketing um, and then meeting with interns, team, just making sure everybody's on the right mindset um, and just pushing, you know, the envelope every day. Well, I'm sure a lot of people listening are thinking, I would love to work at a company that she owns. Um, Are you hiring or do you have internships? We are opening up internships for the summer now. Um, So we just got two new interns. We're always looking for great editorial interns or social media interns. At the moment, we are not hiring, but we probably will around uh, end of fall, beginning of winter as we go and raise a bit more money for this actual seed round. Now that we've launched this new uh, version of Sway, I am determined to go about the fundraising differently and actually put together a strategy that helps me more than, you know, discourages me. So we'll see how that goes. There's always Shark Tank. You could go on Shark Tank. No, I don't think. (laughs) I mean, a lot of my friends went on Shark Tank. It's just not for me. I'm also very uh, picky about the kind of investors and people that I I bring about to the company because, yes, we need money, but I think more importantly, I want to have people I'm excited to work with and that I genuinely think care about what we do. And that's not always easy to find because most investors obviously do it for the money and that's fine. But, you know, if you're if you're lucky, you might encounter people that actually enjoy uh, or share the same mission that you do um, and actually care for, for the mission that is at the core of the company. Of course, they want to see you make money and make their money. But I, I like to align ourselves with uh, people that genuinely care because sometimes things go wrong. You know, sometimes you don't make money quickly or you lose a lot of money. So you don't want people that are only driven by money to be uh, controlling your company because you're not really going to enjoy working there anymore. That makes total sense. Uh, Real quick, if somebody wants to reach out uh, regarding future employment or internships, how can they get a hold of your company? Yeah. So you could email me directly, uh, iman at swaymedia.com, sway with two A's. Uh, There's also a general email, info at swaymedia.com. And um, I'm kind of on social. I mean, LinkedIn for me is really <laughs> when great. You can be. <laughs> when I can be, I'm taking a little break, but I, I'm more on LinkedIn because it's more professional and it's great for our content too. But I still look at other channels. If someone reaches out, I always answer. Oh, very good. Well, hey, I got one more question before we jump into our get to know you questions. Um, you're basically, and you talked a little bit about it earlier. You'll be going between pencil skirts and pant phases. Um, you're a fashionista, at least in my opinion. <laughs> Um, How did you develop your sense of style and your look and kind of how you carry yourself as a businesswoman and quote unquote CEO? Well, I think that I try to stay on top of what's trending right now, but also I am very careful with what I pick because I want to dress for my body. Well, it's great to follow the trends, especially now that we have social media, um, especially Instagram. It seems like a lot of women are, you know, jumping on those trends and everybody's starting to look the same. <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> want to completely keep my personal style as a way to express myself. So right now I'm I'm in a, this pant suit phase. And to me, it just screams like uh, power, confidence. I'm ready to really take myself to the next level as well as my company. So that to me is really what pantsuit is representing. So I think I go through a phase where I either focus on pants, pencil skirts, or dresses. I definitely had a phase of dresses during pageantry. It obviously makes sense. But now, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm on the business side. So that's what determines what I, how I dress is, is really what I'm dressing for. Well, very good. Well, you, look, you're, you're setting a great example and you're obviously doing some great work out there. So uh, thanks for answering all the questions about Sway and going into kind of the details of it. Um, so at this point, um, I just, I really just want to have some fun with you here. Some rapid fire, get to know Iman Ubu questions. So it's 10 questions, totally fun and positive to just have some fun with it. You ready? Yep. All right, here we go. Number one, how many hours of sleep do you need a night? Seven. Wow. That's actually surprising. Yeah. 
Well, I used to sleep like three, four hours because that's what they tell you, you know, you have to sacrifice your self-care and all that stuff to be successful. Then I went through a really bad health period last summer and that now completely changed the way I go about my day, hence the morning routine and just taking time for myself. So I think it's important. If you're not sleeping well and you're not rested, you can't run a company, you can't manage people, you can't be in a good mood. It, it just affects everything if actually you're up you know, working, you're doing yourself a big favor. All right, seven hours. Okay, number two. Do you believe in love at first sight? No. I mean, <laughs> I'm... <laughs> not for me. It's, I'm, I'm not saying everybody shouldn't believe it, but for me, I think being the type A I am and the super detailed person, it takes me a while to really think that I'm even in love it took me like years to even say the first i love you <laughs> well i think that's probably a good thing yeah number three how many cups of coffee do you drink a day two i'm ashamed of it but <laughs> trying to cut down to one <laughs> it's not Slowly a great thing number four what's the maximum number of spritzes of perfume before you think it's too much oh i used to be you know, in school, I used to do like four, five, or sometimes six, like before a night out, <laughs> you know, because you're like, I want it to last. I want it to last. And now I'm like, two is enough because these are the perfume somehow, or maybe I'm, I'm growing old, but are a lot stronger nowadays. So it's two is enough. And where do you put it? Your neck, your shoulders? I do neck and sometimes I do wrist. Very good. Number five, when people stand up for a standing ovation, are you usually one of the earlier people to stand up or one of the later? It depends. If it's obvious that it means a stand ovation, like, you know, I, I get up. Like, I'm like, okay, this is a no-brainer. Sometimes if I have to question it, I have to wait for people to do it first. Then I'm the last one. <laughs> so it depends on what we're talking about. Um, but I try to be kind of like in sync with everybody. I, I read the room. Number six, the last song that you either listened to or downloaded. Oh, this one's good. Uh, it is, I know the artist is Candy, K-A-N-D-Y, and the name of the song is uh, Keep In Secret. Yeah, it's kind of like my um, positive vibe, like type of song that I listen to on my commute just to, to get excited. I love it. Okay. Number seven. What's something, uh, and not everybody can do this, what's something that you could eat for a week straight? A uh, croissant. That'd be a long week. <laughs> I, believe it or not, I get full from it. So I think I might just need like one or two a day and I'll be good. Uh, number eight, since you are a fashionista, what is your favorite clothing brand? Ooh, uh, tough one. I, I, I've been trying to uh, support female-founded brands recently, uh, not recently, as of the last three years, so I really buy from, from those. And one that I love is uh, Misha Collection. It's founded by an awesome 25-year-old woman based, I think, out of Australia, but they have the best uh, professional but still stylish collection that you could use from day to night as a woman on the go. So I would definitely go with that as my favorite right now. All right. Number nine, who, uh, and, and this may be multiple people, it might be one, who inspires you? One is my mother. She'll always be my number one inspiration, as obviously for everything she's gone through for us. Um, and right now, I, I think Roxanne Gay really inspires me. Just I love listening to her talks and reading her books. You know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She wrote the book Bad Feminist. And I just think that it's really applicable to what we're going through right now. And her views are very compelling. So it kind of pushes me to do something about, you know, the change that I want to make. Sure. Well, I actually don't know about her, so I'll, I'll look her up. I'd love to learn about her. Number 10. Mm -hmm. First celebrity crush, who was it? Oh, Leonardo DiCaprio, obviously. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Any particular movie that you liked him in? I think you know, Titanic. Um, <laughs> I think that's like my first one. And I watched it, you know, like back when I was in Morocco, in French. It was like a different experience than being an American watching Titanic, probably. So 
it was definitely a huge hit in Morocco, as, as it is everywhere else. But yeah. What was his name in the movie? Jack, is that right? Jack, yeah. Jack, okay. And Rose. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're off the hook. You answered the 10 questions. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, real quick before we go here, tell me what, what the future holds for Sway Media. Where are you going with it? Um, what, what are we going to see here in the rest of 2019? So we're going to keep growing our, uh, obviously, contributors, uh, voices on the platform, and uh, growing our membership. So definitely focused on um, growth a lot now that we have the new platform up and running. And of course, we're going to be innovating and adding new features and launching, hopefully, uh, our events before the end of the year. So we definitely want to start bringing our community together offline. So that's something we're actively planning and strategizing around so that we can add more value to the women we serve. It's not just content, but it's also the community aspect of it and meeting other like-minded women. Well, very good. Well, best of luck to you. I appreciate Honestly, what what you're doing and how you're doing it, I think it's making a big difference, and I have no doubt it's going to continue to grow. And uh, as we mentioned, you are a super busy woman, so thanks for taking the time today to come on the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really had a lot of fun talking about all that we're doing, and thanks again for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to today's episode, everybody, and to Iman Ubu for her time. Now, if you want to follow Iman on social media, you can do so on Instagram, at Iman Ubu, if you're wondering how to spell that, that's I-M-A-N-O-U-B-O-U. Or you can follow her company at Sway Media, Sway with two A's, by the way. I hope you enjoyed the podcast, everybody. If you wouldn't mind, please subscribe. You can do so on Spotify, iTunes, the podcast app, Google Play, and YouTube. Or you can just go to lifeafterthecrown.com. And for weekly podcast updates, just follow me on Instagram at Tim Tialdo. Until next time, remember the words of Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Have an awesome week, everybody. Music